Few multiplayer games achieve the chaos and visceral action movie feeling that Torn Banner's Chivalry 2 puts on the table. With great swordplay, interestingly designed team objective modes, and great visuals, a game like it can come very far. But sound is the unsung hero of an action game title. Sound design is an often overlooked aspect of game design, due to its nature. Sound design mostly becomes noticeable when there is a problem with it. If everything sounds as it should, there is often no need to point it out. And especially for an experience which emulates the Hollywood interpretation of medieval warfare, the soundscapes can be a bit too busy to really take in and analyze on the fly. At least I can help out in bringing up the most interesting aspects of the sound design for you. Put on your helmets and pick up your weapon. Welcome to Sound Designing Games. It can be a bit hard to describe how visceral Chivalry 2 truly is. So much is going on around you at the same time. Destruction, death, dings and clanks, taunts and yelps, running, rustling and smashing. Chivalry's design is a worst case scenario for making a coherent and functionally sound audio system that doesn't tire the player. When taking the sound design of Chivalry 2 apart, it becomes apparent how much information is conveyed to the player subliminally, to not distract from the experience, but also to effectively inform the player of happenings hundreds of meters away, but also right in the immediate surroundings. A bloody skirmish is unfolding right in front of us. Agatha and the Mason Order, warring factions that have been going at it for years. A conflict that is seemingly endless in a world that is accustomed to brutality and violent conquest. Let us get down at foot level to explore how the battlefield sounds from one of the many warriors' perspectives. <laughs> The warriors, some of them present against their will, only have one option. Push ahead and destroy the enemy. Almost as if the soldiers are in tunnel vision. Or rather, tunnel hearing. A major role of sound design in a game is the establishment of context for the player and the environment they are flung into. While visuals should look pretty too, their role mostly lies in accessibility and also in appeal. The visual aspects of the game are vitally important, but no matter how good a game looks, most game experiences depend on well-designed audio to make an experience functional, rewarding and emotionally impactful. The visuals represent the scene, but the audio shapes the scene into something meaningful, adding function and emotional weight to an experience. Chivalry 2 tries to depict a violent battlefield and it succeeds masterfully. The voice acting, sound effects, environmental sounds, soundtrack and audio mixing all contribute to the epic medieval warfare portrayed in Chivalry 2. Audio mixing especially is the most important factor in terms of functionality for the game, as you will realize throughout the entire presentation, as it is vitally important in every aspect of Chivalry 2's sound design. For a melee-centric medieval fighting game, Chivalry 2 had to nail the combat. It not only has to sound good and exciting, but it has to be functional for 64-player servers, not be too overwhelming and chaotic for the player in order for them to orient themselves in the battlefield and know where the danger comes from. And the audio, of course, has to be fitting with a the medieval theme of the game. Chivalry 2 features a running respawn, that means that the player from the second they spawn is in constant motion, with several other people. Getting to the combat is quite easy, as the player is always oriented towards the next objective they had to get to. But additionally, further adjustments have been made to make it easier to differentiate between friend and foe. Footsteps are not all represented equally. While footsteps come with their details, like the sounds of different armor types being layered on top of the step, the more interesting part of the footstep is the difference in volume between factions. The 
steps of a foe are significantly louder than the steps of a friend, reducing confusion and making it easier to find people to fight against in the chaos of a 64-player server. Contrast this with a game that has the same loudness and footsteps across teams. In a game where individual performance is much more important and where the team sizes are considerably smaller, knowing where friend and foe are exactly might be an advantage. Counter-Strike, with its smaller teams, small arenas and team-based gameplay, does not need to amplify the footsteps of an enemy, as a lot of the times an enemy is identified visually, while ranged combat also takes precedence over knife duels up close. Highly experienced Counter-Strike players can even pinpoint where exactly a friend or foe is located in the map, based on sound alone. In Chivalry we have a completely different type of multiplayer experience. Individual performance isn't as important, and with the sheer size of the battlefields and player numbers, there was much more of a necessity to amplify certain sounds over others. The audio mixing does not end here. Depending on if a fight is being fought by other people with or without your involvement, sounds of swords clanging together and deflecting from each other will be different. A separation from distant fights and fights you are directly involved in had to be established to ensure that information is being correctly conveyed to the player in order to understand where a hit is coming from and where a distant battle takes place in relation to where a battle you are involved in begins. Every player has an invisible bubble surrounding them that symbolizes the character's personal space. Attacks happening in that sphere are heightened through sound additions that are only played if an attack pierces the bubble. We had a programmer put in a personal bubble around you, so maybe the size of another person all the way around. And any time a projectile, or even the swings, that we talked about the swing sounds when they're big, is when that uh, personal bubble is being penetrated. So that's when you hear those really loud arrow sounds like And um, you can't hear that for every arrow. Not only would it take away the specialness of those sound effects by hearing them all the time, you would always think you were just, you know, being fired at. But when you hear those, that means a guy just missed you. So you're either incidentally in the line of fire or like keep moving, get cover, because some archers got a bead on you. This is Ryan Buckley, the sound designer of Chivalry 2 and other Torn Banner titles. I got to chat with him about all the aspects of Chivalry 2's audio and was blown away by a lot of the little details. Some of the more combat-centric systems even have surprising origins in another game developed by Torn Banner. This is Mirage Arcane Warfare, a game that married the visceral combat of Chivalry together with magic and high mobility. It sadly is a dead multiplayer game, but a lot of Chivalry 2's DNA lies in that title. Regarding audio, one system in particular was carried over from that magical slasher game. Oh, I think something specifically that we pulled over, how we're doing um, projectiles, because that was the magic-based game. You're throwing giant boulders or shooting fireballs. So what we learned in Mirage, to help the player identify when he was being fired at, right? As opposed to just when there's a projectile in the air. Because it does sound cool when all the arrows are going foo, 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 foo. But then you get hit and you're like, well, I didn't, I didn't think they were shooting at me, right? So we learned very quickly in Mirage that we had to do something different. So there we put our, um, our projectiles on a cone attenuation where most sounds have a full circle of, you know, how long of a distance you can hear it. We have the arrows on a, on a cone. So if you're, if, you know, if they're aiming at you and this is enveloping your ears, now you're getting the full volume. And I believe we added an extra level like an extra set of sound effects to make the projectile even bigger. Um, and so if you're out of that range, you still hear them, but they're muffled. They go through like a low pass filter or something. So they're still there as color. But if you if you pretty clearly hear an arrow as a player, if you haven't figured it out yet, they're shooting at you. And they're most likely shooting at you or somebody very close to you. And another tool, which was heavily utilized in Chivalry 2, was also first implemented in Mirage. And then the rest was just, you know, this first time working with Wise. So I think at the time I was sort of feeling my way through it. Um, by the time Chivalry 2 I was working on it, I, I felt like I had a firm grasp of that middleware, so. And not to mention, Mirage being set in an Arabian Nights setting also served as splendid inspiration for the new Persian-style Tenojin invasion update, which introduced combat in desert regions. 
Mirage Arcane Warfare was a significant inspiration for Chivalry 2, and while there is so much more to explore in that game, we have to get back to the main subject of this presentation. It was, it was a fun game. I really enjoyed playing and testing that. There were probably a lot of reasons why you know it didn't work out, but uh, it was fun for audios because you know I, I do love the Chivalry franchise. It's very fun, but um, it's very rooted in realism. And in Mirage, you know, we got to do all this crazy stuff with magic. So it was fun sort of getting a break from just the constant smashing of metal and <laughs> screaming and blood. I mean, that was all in there, but uh, it was also that uh, fantasy. Level. Aside from the directional and distant audio, there is a lot going on in Chivalry 2's combat department. Aside from the clanking metal sounds themselves, we have the hard-hitting impacts, which are multiple layered sounds, culminating in a satisfyingly crunchy and painful sounding impact. It wasn't just impacts for swords, maces and axes that needed to be taken into account, but ranged weapons, shield throwing and improvised weaponry also. During the fight we also have a lot of emoting from friends and foes, which not only makes the battlefield a little bit livelier, it also is a quite popular gameplay mechanic. Actually, let us talk about the voice act. The difficulty just goes in the, just the sheer amount of time of writing the scripts, casting the actors, scheduling the actors, getting the actors in, and then the, the sessions themselves are like three to four hours. I mean, they're grueling. I do some voices myself. Um, I kind of, you can hear I lost my voice a little bit. I was just stubbing in some commander voices for like a future update and uh, I lost my voice in an hour. These professionals, you can tell <laughs> that they're professional because, you know, they're, they're athletes. They're, they're working out their vocal cords all the time. I think we probably push them more than, than most games. And then cutting um, the, the files. Of, sometimes we do them in-house. We put them in, then we gotta test the volume levels and everybody, you know, the timber's different. And, you know, we talked about that hot part of the EQ. Some guys are right in there, so they come out louder and some of the deeper, richer voices we got to sort of wrestle with um, constant batch processing, like let's do the EQ here, or this and that. From wimps to nobles and hardened warriors, Chivalry 2 features a range of many different voices, all harboring different personalities, insults, and funny little phrases. It is even possible to communicate with each other only through in-game voice commands. Surprisingly, this aspect of communication has arisen accidentally. In the writing itself, I mean, sometimes you'd come up line and be like, oh, that's gonna play off well if somebody does that. It does happen, but um, most of it is completely random. Now, some of the options, like we did expand that VO wheel. I think we had an extra one or two extra ones. We did add more, like, like you said, for dual server stuff that they may wanna use. Um, and then we added the actual physical emotes too. So we did think of that somewhat for VO, but most of it is just random when it works out. Role playing is really important in Chivalry too. Personally, I love the Squire Boy. A good example for a funny character with tons of personality. A guy that really does not want to be there. I, I'm glad you brought up Squire Boy because I, I love all our voice actors, all our characters were good, but there was something about even the writing of that guy. like. Just that was his character. It was the guy who really didn't want to be there in such a comical Uncle, sense. Uncle. It was like so easy to write for. Um, the guy, I'm gonna forget his name. I know I mentioned in the other interview. The guy who came in, knew exactly what we were trying to do and just banged it like he just, one line after the other. Everyone's laughing the whole time. That was a really special character. I'm not surprised. I think he's probably a lot of people's favorite. Ah, my mom is not a hobby horse. The Squire Boy is faction exclusive to the Agathians. Actually, every voice is faction exclusive to one of the three factions in the game. This is another intentional design choice to further separate the teams from each other. There also is a screaming button, which the player can spam at their discretion, which paints the battlefield and incoming hordes of warriors with a diverse assortment of screams, in addition to the many combat sounds and other miscellaneous sound sources, which puts into question how the game was optimized for consoles. With a ton of sound sources and combat, 
music playing in the background, environmental sounds, and battle cry spam, Chivalry 2 needs to process an incredible amount of data. For games, a big balancing act is uncompressed versus compressed sounds. Uncompressed audio does not need to get decoded by the CPU, but a larger file is loaded into random access memory. A compressed file is significantly smaller and takes up much less space in RAM, but the file has to be decoded by the CPU. This is important because not only sounds, but every other file needed for the game to run has to be loaded into memory. The CPU cannot be stressed too much either, as it is needed to handle many other processes in the game, with physics calculations, AI, and also animations being just a few examples of what a CPU could process in the game. This balancing act makes it a bit difficult to optimize a game for the consoles. That's exactly the trade-off. And when it came to consoles, yeah, with PC, the optimization, I mean, it's still difficult and you want to get, you know, lower spec users in there. Um, but there's no way around it on consoles. And uh, yeah, just what you said, that, that RAM versus CPU fight uh, can, can get tricky. This means bad news for a 64-player multiplayer game in which over 100 sounds can be triggered simultaneously at any moment and even play continuously while also having to load all the other game assets into memory. And by the way, the game not only has to work on a PS5 and Series X, which boasts 16 gigabytes of RAM, but also the last-gen consoles, which only have half of the memory available. Sadly, compromises had to be made. So I think by the time we get down to, you know, the past gen, um, you know, the, the PS4 um, and whatnot, we had to limit the amount of, of sound you could hear. But in some cases, we're, we're also limiting the quality of the source. Um, so this was the great thing about our partnership with Tripwire is they they did, you know, majority of that uh, QA. They've been working in console for so long, and that was a big deal with our partnership. So. Um, where I wasn't able to work it out, they were able to come in and say, I think here's the system, we ran into the same problem, you know, here's the system we built. And it was just sort of chipping away where you could at these things. But there's a lot of layers of protection built in the whys, so you can set, you know, the priority, how important is the sound? So a footstep ultimately, is it more important than the impact? No, so we can judge that. The aero travel sound, is it as important? Like, yeah, it's, it's kind of more important, we need to hear if it's coming in. And so you're sort of like, so you do your priority. So. When we do hit the max level of sounds, we're picking which sounds we drop first. And that um, priority system's also based on proximity if we want it to. So, all right, melee sounds are very important, but at this sort of distance, they're not as important. So it's this constant, like, they don't really need to hear this, they won't notice if we throw it away. And that system, you know, it took a while, trial and error. With a combination of various compressed and uncompressed files, lower bitrate data and cutting certain sounds off at a certain distance, the console versions of Chivalry 2 sound marginally worse. But not by too much. The Unreal Engine supports the Vorbis codec, which saves sound files in AUG containers. This audio format has a higher compression ratio than the MP3 format, allowing smaller bit rates, but harboring a better quality than MP3 files with a comparable bitrate. To put the benefits of AUG Vorbis over MP3 very simply, file size smaller, quality better. You know, it was constantly like, you need to save 10 megabytes of RAM for us in the game, or, um, you know, we. 2% CPU needs to come back out of audio. And um, yeah, constantly find ways to do that. Thanks to the middleware software WISE, audio systems that exist in Chivalry 2 were able to be prototyped by Buckley to then be hard-coded into the game by programmers. One impressive feature relates to distant battles. The most important sounds during combat, like the big impacts, explosions, sounding horns, and battle cries, are accentuated in order for them, and only them, to be played dozens and hundreds of meters away. We took certain sounds like uh, death cries, I think like heavy pain sounds, because like small, medium, and large ones, uh, battle cries. We added a distant sound system that has those, they play, you know, rooted from you um, in the close proximity as you would normally hear them. But then for people far away, we added sort of an echoing over the hills. Uh, you hear this with um, a lot of blocking sounds. So as you're approaching the battle, you might not see it. They might be behind you know, the castle walls, but you'll know where most of the fighting is happening because this second layer of sound is coming at you. Um, so that's, that's both for gameplay reasons and for artistic reasons. 
This achieves two things. For one, less sounds have to be played at once, reducing space taken up in RAM and also minimizing CPU usage. Added to this, there is another knock-on effect, which would be a dynamic and natural soundscape system in which distant combat and voice commands are not only for show, but are actually happening in-game. Half-Life 2 features soundscapes, which play a variety of sounds randomly. Those distant audio sources do not represent actual happenings in the game world, but they suggest that something is happening kilometers away. In reality, nothing is happening. But that does not matter in a single-player game. For Chivalry 2 and other multiplayer experiences, this system would not be good for combat sounds. Imagine the sounds of fighting in the distance with a low server population, or worse, no players at all present in a server. Fake combat sounds are immersion breaking, but not having any distant combat sounds results in silence while playing in a populated server, which also is not good. So a solution like Chivalry 2's is not only great for optimization, it also enables a dynamic soundscape that accurately scales with the current server population. Smart. Wise also muffles sounds that happen behind walls, it enables dynamic music, it can modulate sounds on the fly, and even add certain audio layers when certain actions are committed. It is a nifty middleware, which is great for prototyping or even to be used in the final version of the game. Like, if we didn't have Wise, that would have, <laughs> we would have had to hire several programmers probably to just get that system in. Um, and I sound like a salesman for wise, but... <laughs> hey everyone, my name is Cheekin, the creator of this video. If you like high quality gaming videos or anything that has to do with really strange subjects, then please consider supporting this channel by liking, by sharing, just in general, showing your support in the comments. You could also show support by doing a one-time donation or by supporting me on Patreon, Gumroad or YouTube memberships. So if you enjoyed this video a teensy weensy bit and you would like to see more high quality productions in the future, then please consider donating and also rating the videos, sharing them around. It would be a gigantic help. To recover a bit from the techno talk whiplash, we now have the golden opportunity to take things slow and appreciate nature. Or, well, other stuff in our environment which is less screamy. Chivalry 2 has a surprisingly detailed soundscape in every level I have examined so far. Bodies of water sound appropriate. Flies and mosquitoes whisk by your ears. Seagulls seagull away on the beaches where you also hear the waves crashing in. All things considered, Chivalry 2 has a surprisingly relaxing atmosphere when the Agathians and the Mason Order don't want to constantly kill each other in the many beautiful maps the game has to offer. Let us take Aberfell as an example. Say, you are an Agathian and arrive by boat on the shore, running straight into a skirmish. If you listen real close, you can make out the granularity of the scene with the aforementioned seagulls and waves crashing into the sea. If you move upstream a bit, you will hear the waves and seagulls less and less, but the sounds of a stream, a river, will become more and more prominent. This is achieved with event triggers. The sound designer dictates where to play the sounds of flowing water instead of waves crashing on the beach. Let us visualize what those trigger zones might look like. These circles represent different sound sources that will play within them. Moving away from a circle more and more will result in the sound gradually fading out. When two circles intersect and a player would move from one circle into another, the player would hear a gradual crossfade from one sound into the next, achieving a simple but convincing gradients of sounds, blending into and away from each other. Arriving at the little village, or encampment, the water sounds change to a lighter trickle instead of gushing flowing water. Going further upstream though, we hear more harshly flowing water being reintroduced. So essentially, what happened here was that Buckley went through all the levels and implemented meticulously detailed soundscapes in every little part of the map. 
Maps are littered with other environmental props too, like ballistas, trebuchets, destructible structures, and siege vehicles, which all emit their own characteristic sounds. Fire sources also give off fiery sounds, which I have seldom noticed in game. And sounds like explosions are heard throughout the entire map. For instance, when a gate gets blown up, or the ship's masts go kaput and gather. In one map there is a waterfall on the right side of the castle from the invader's perspective and appropriate waterfall sounds are present, even though not many players would find themselves there. Or this absolutely beautiful lake in the same map features an amazingly relaxing soundscape with insects whizzing by and I believe even frogs croaking. But that portion of the map is relatively far off from the places where most of the battles take place. And all of this in a game with 48 to 64 player lobbies, filled with people screaming and smashing each other over their heads with Zweihänder and full plate armor. One might say that putting so much environmental detail in the soundscapes may be a waste of time, but in reality it is exactly what most games need. Chivalry 2 is actively played by many right now, but player numbers won't stay high forever. Additionally, Huge skirmishes are mostly localized in one specific area of the map, while smaller duels may happen outside of mission objective areas where more environmental sounds would be vital for making a map feel alive. Too many games have either very minimal environmental sounds or none at all, which makes a game less believable and even makes a multiplayer map somewhat uncomfortable to play on. Sometimes what a soldier needs is a reminder. My favorite little sound implementation of the game is this synthetic tick of the clock. Over time, I notice that every now and again I look up to the top of the screen to check the clock. The game manages to subliminally inform the player to pay attention at the time, making them look up at a most of the times hard to distinguish clock during normal gameplay. In a game where every sound has to feel rustic and be in line with the time period, an alien sounding tick of the clock may be the best sound to inform the player that something is up. That stuff is, is driven um, on our team, but not as much by me, but by our designers. Our, our designers are very... Um, they got a hand in everything and they're very sure of how they want to present the game and how they don't want to distract the player Just what you say and those guys are pretty brilliant at it and um, I think they push the envelope where, where they can in doing that and um, yeah, I'm thinking of uh, Rasmus Lofstrom um, I believe he's the one who asked for that and he, he'll ask me I, I'll give him several iterations and he may never be happy <laughs> with Some of the sounds I've given him, but I know he's he's just pushing it and trying to get that perfect perfect communicating without interrupting. And um, so if he's listening, we did it, Raz. We did it with the clocks. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I'm a big fan of it. But cool meta sounds aside, what is an epic medieval multiplayer game without great music? Chivalry 2 features a lot of epic music, ranging from the bombastic end of round ensembles to the calm main menu composition and to the many accents playing when entering a new arena or when leveling up. In Chivalry 2, music takes on a much more prominent role than it ever did in Medieval Warfare. It also was composed by a person who is new blood at Torn Banner Studios. This is JD, the guy that composed the soundtrack of Chivalry 2. Interestingly, the composer for the first game was Ryan Buckley, the now sound designer of Chivalry 2. How come JD became the composer of Chivalry 2? Well, I was incredibly fortunate. Um, I actually reached out to Torn Banner before I even knew about Chivalry 2. Uh, I actually didn't hear anything until about a year later. Uh, oh. And a year later, I, I got a random email from uh, Alex Hader, one of the producers on Chivalry 2. Uh, and he was like, hey, you know, you, you reached out like a year ago and, you know, we didn't really need a composer at that point, but we're actually looking now. Um, would you be interested in doing a demo? And so they gave me sort of the brief on what Chivalry 2 was going to be and kind of what they were looking for. 
uh, and then I wrote a couple of short pieces of music sort of as an audition. And, you know, I felt like it went really, it, it went well, you know, I was happy with the pieces I sent in. And um, uh, yeah, a, a little while later I heard back and, and they wanted to, to move forward with, uh, with, with hiring me. So I, <laughs> I was very, very fortunate. That usually does not, that story usually does not go that way. So after sending a demo and landing a job, JD got to work. The soundtrack went through an interesting transformation throughout the development process of Chivalry 2. Initially, the soundtrack was composed using samples in a digital audio workstation. But later on, the music was recorded in a live orchestra. <laughs> and that because the studio had extra time on its hands. Live recordings have their advantages, especially when it comes to how much livelier the music feels. We thought, you know, why not? Why not get some live orchestra on this, on some of the key pieces of music? Much of the score uh, is still what you just described. It's it's samples. Sample libraries these days um, are, are getting better and better, and you can get closer and closer to it being, you know, uh, sort of the, the, the difference being unrecognizable, I guess, to, to most people's ears. I just don't think there that anything will ever replace the feeling of a bunch of people in a room playing music. And it might be, somewhat negligible to you know to your ears or whatever here and there but I, I still there's just there are so many intangibles um, and there's such an energy to it that just can't be replicated otherwise um, not to mention I mean I just think that especially when you have mus live musicians in the room no matter how good the samples are no matter how beautifully they were recorded um, it just sounds it just sounds better <laughs> like nothing's ever going to replace that in my opinion the soundtrack consists of both dynamic stem-based music and linear music files. Stem-based dynamic music works in the following way. It's different stems um, that are part of the same linear track. And so they're basically layered. The, the base layer doesn't have a whole lot going on. You know, the second layer, when it comes in and blends with that layer, like maybe there's a little more going on, some percussion or some stings here and there, and then so on and so forth until it's sort of a full-fledged uh, piece of music that has some momentum. Each track can play on its own or be played in combination with another or multiple other stems. Linear music would be a music track that plays from beginning to end as one whole piece, something everyone is accustomed to when listening to music casually. While there is absolutely nothing wrong with linear tracks, dynamic music, as the term implies, can be as reactive and malleable as a musician wants it to be. You know, there are some high points in that music. It definitely ebbs and flows, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's a little bit, again, it's just sort of sitting underneath the sound design and things like that. But it just kind of gets subtly more intense as, uh, basically as the objective bar progresses at the top of the screen is sort of what it's tied to. The dynamic music of Chivalry 2 is kept more in the background of the game, as it would otherwise distract from the sounds that matter most during gameplay. The SFX. Implementing dynamic music in this way comes with its challenges. I didn't want to do a lot of like really like low percussion and uh, things kind of in the low end that were really uh, prominent because there's so much going on in the audio space in Chivalry. There's, you know, obviously you have all the incredible sound design that Ryan's doing, but it's very in your face by design. And a lot of the sounds are very percussive and deep and they, ha they hit you really hard. So if I was doing a lot of rhythmic stuff, especially in the low end, I think it would just kind of muddy that up a lot. And it wouldn't really, not only would the music not really stand out that much, but it would also maybe make what Ryan is doing worse, which I don't want to do, right? The most prominent use of linear music files would be the end of round music at the very end of a match, or when the time for an objective is running out. That timeout music that comes in when there's two minutes left, you know, obviously the goal of it is to motivate the player to either either defend or, or advance, depending on what team they're on, uh, before the time runs out, and so, or to hold out for the, for the two minutes, depending on what team you're on. Yeah, and I think that those two minute pieces are really when the music comes to the forefront. Uh, the other music in the during the matches is is designed to be a bit more reserved and sort of sit underneath the sound design and just kind of be there to give a little bit of a little bit of color, a little bit of character, and then really kick in at the end of the, either the two minutes or at the end of the round itself. The linear tracks for the round ending music have different variations that swap each other out to avoid too much repetition, as repetition is immersion breaking and too repetitive. And that actually, interestingly 
that idea, uh, as, as far as those that those sort of dynamic loops, I guess I'll call them, they, that came from player feedback during alpha testing. Um, you know, people want felt like it was getting, you know, too repetitive at times. So that that uh, that um, prompted us to not only add more tracks, but also to to sort of come up with that system to where, you know, even if you're hearing the same track again for the for the second time within a couple of matches or whatever, um, you know, there are sections of it that you might not have heard yet. As to the orchestral music, it makes one wonder how smoothly recording really goes with so many instrumentalists performing these ensembles they never played before. These orchestras who do this specifically for a living, they're playing on you know, television and film and video game scores, they're, they're sight reading everything. This is the first time they've ever seen it. In sessions like this, there's no rehearsal take. You just, you just go. <laughs> and then, uh, and, they're, and they're, they're expert sight readers. So what they have, in, as long as the, you know, as long as it's been orchestrated well and, and they have the music in front of them, they're very good at, at nailing it within a few takes. We were knocking out several tracks in, in uh, you know, in just a couple, a couple of hours. Like it's not, it's not like a day long thing for a track or anything like that. Um, again, they're very quick and very efficient. And these kinds of sessions, we did have somewhat limited time. So we had to move through them pretty quickly. And I was remote in my studio in Nashville, um, you know, attending in real time, not unlike what we're doing right now. Um, and so it was, uh, it was kind of a interesting experience because I'm, in the booth, you know, producing, but I'm just in my studio at home, communicating with the conductor and stuff like that, you know, trying to get what I need. I'm glad, again, that technology is where it is. And of course, the pandemic even kind of pushed that even further in terms of us all having to do that for, some, for a while. To finalize a piece of music, there are some more extra steps needed. For instance, many instruments were recorded individually and then mixed together in post. Entirely different recordings from different takes were mixed and matched together and even digital components were reintroduced into the music to deliver more flavor to the track and make a piece stand out more. Most of the time I'd hear them all play at once, but then I'd have each section play it through so that I had isolated takes of just the strings, just the brass, woodwinds, everything, um, so that I could kind of have more control over the mix and things like that. But also, as you mentioned before, sort of taking the best takes from everything is a little bit easier when it's separated like that. Torn Banner also did not impose many restrictions on the music production, as the gameplay didn't need to eliminate the reverb in the music or set other notable restrictions aside from, of course, utilizing a more classical, thematically appropriate style of music. J.D. Spears managed to reimagine compositions which were initially written by Buckley into new, original compositions, referencing motifs from Medieval Warfare soundtrack. Working with Ryan has been such a great experience for me. Uh, I'm very thankful as a composer to have, you know, this being my most notable project to date, to have been working not only with such a great team, but specifically Ryan is, um, he's just a normal, nice guy. And he's and he's not, yeah, he's, he's not uh, overly protective of that stuff. He wants the game to be the best it can be. He wants the music to be, uh, the best it can be and uh, he was you know he, everything from sort of distilling the feedback from the team into into something that I could take action on uh, to giving you know positive encouragement even when I wasn't asking you know he just random positive encouragement um, just a great a great person to work with and, and I learned a lot too about you know game audio from just just from working with him too because he's a great audio director as well as being such a good good guy. Yeah, I think we did a really good job in keeping music a constant, but not so much that you're like, all right, I want to turn it off. Um, but yeah, JD may be happy to know that I always leave his music on. Our job is to secure the equipment. In the sum of its parts, Chivalry 2 provides a surprisingly reactive and dynamic soundscape that puts the main emphasis on the hero of the game, which would be the combat. With audio mixing taking on a major role in the game's sound design, Buckley made sure that factions are unmistakable. Friend is clearly separated from foe, the player is aware of their personal space, and that the player always keeps the progression of the game in mind. The game's design imposed some limitations, 
mainly the massive battles that could take place on the battlefield, and the fact that the game is a cross-platform title. But with smart and thought-out compromises, and a lot of trial and error, those limitations could be effectively overcome, making a reactive and compelling soundscape possible even on last-generation consoles. Sometimes, just creating cool sounds, voices and music is not really enough to make a game readable and functional. Many times it needs many small adjustments and some technical trickery to make an experience sound leaks better. Chivalry 2 provided us with an important lesson. Sometimes the most important part of the game's sound design lies in putting an emphasis on certain sounds over others. It may sound like a bit of a boring conclusion, but maybe all your game really needs is to turn a few dials.